Ladies and gentlemen, honorable guests, your excellencies, welcome back. As I mentioned before the break, the topic of the next panel is mobility. It's a very key topic. Not only that one of the many wonderful benefits that the EU gives us is the freedom of movement, we got used to the fact that we could go from, let's say, Portugal to Estonia for a very little amount of money. It became extremely accessible. We can go around Europe not only to travel, we can go to different European countries to establish businesses, to meet new friends, to establish friendships or even families. And we got used to that, but the thing is, as mentioned prior to this, we need to look at the green perspective as well, and we need to focus on the emissions. So how do we make it? How do we keep mobility accessible for the people, as well as we keep it sustainable for the future? And that is a topic that will be resolved in the following panel that's going to be moderated by Mrs. Arva Mariani, the board member and partner with Brains Capital SRL Benefit Company. Arva, Welcome to the stage, and I give the floor to you, and I'm looking forward to hear all the options about the mobility. Thank you very much. I'm very honored to uh, be moderating this panel today. Thank you, Jano, and to the organizers. And the first thing we will um, have the pleasure to watch is a video address um, sent to us by uh, Commissioner Maur Sefcovic. Good afternoon. My thanks to the organizers of the Prague European Summit for inviting me to address you today. The decarbonization and electrification of road transport is a key part of our plans for a greener Europe. The shift to zero emission mobility is not only inevitable, but is already well underway. Already tomorrow, we will bring forward an ambitious legislative package called FIT for 55, which will set the right long-term policy framework for the accelerated take-up of zero-emission vehicles. For road transport, the interplay of CO2 standards for cars and vans and the revision of the Directive on Alternative Fuels Infrastructure is of particular relevance to ensure that there is a push for greater uptake of zero emission vehicles on the one hand and for sufficient recharging infrastructure on the other. Europe has become a world leader in e-mobility with over a million electric vehicles sold more than in China. We therefore need to make sure that by the end of this decade, there are 3 million charging points across the European Union to meet this growing demand to ensure that this is done in a geographical fair manner. We must maintain the momentum we have built up with our work under the European Battery Alliance uh, particularly important. To foster private investment, the European Commission approved two battery-related important projects of the common European interest, known as IPSES, with an estimated 20 billion euros in funding. And I'm pleased that this participation includes the Slovak company Innovat, which is today sharing its expertise in battery systems. In addition, last month, the Commission launched the battery partnership under the Horizon Europe research program with 925 million euros allocated for battery research over the next seven years, which will be matched by private investment. We now need swift adoption of our proposed regulatory framework on batteries to ensure that only the greenest, best performing and safest batteries make it onto the EU market. We must equip Europe with a workforce uh, with the skills necessary for e-mobility revolution. According to Inno Energy, some 800,000 workers will need to be trained by 2025 for our battery industry. One example of our efforts here is the Automotive Skills uh, Alliance coordinated uh, by the Technical University of Ostrava. And we need to accelerate development of a more resilient raw material segment of the battery's value chain, including by boosting our own domestic capacities. 
for example, several lithium projects being developed uh, in the EU, including the Czech Republic, could supply as much as 80% of EU demand by 2025. But we need to overcome the important challenge of social acceptance. In this context, later this year, the Commission will launch a roundtable on environmentally and socially sustainable raw materials mining, engaging public authorities, industry, NGOs and social partners. At the same time, financial institutions like the EIB will be key in helping mobilize financing for sustainable and responsible raw materials projects. I believe Central and Eastern Europe can play a leading role in the energy transition, including areas like batteries and the development of electric vehicles. I will stop there. I wish you an enjoyable event. Um, Commissioner Sefcovic has laid the ground uh, for the discussion which we're going to address today. And yesterday's uh, opening panel with the four ministers from the Visegrad state, uh, states, including uh, um, the German minister from Saxony, has already approached and discussed the main issue of the transition, which has been reminded us, we, we are being reminded us of the importance of social, uh, of, of the just transition. Uh, if we don't get people on board, we will not be able to uh, achieve the success of the Green Deal. For doing this, we need three things. We need uh, shift societal change. We need technological change. We need also a change in the economic fundamentals and price system that regulate our economies. This sounds very easily said, but it requires a transition and a transformation, which is uh, a, basically an accelerated uh, industrial revolution in a very short time frame, because the time left is short. Now, the fin funding and climate finance is actually going to play an extremely important role in this transition. And we have here uh, today the pleasure to host uh, the lending branch of the European uh, Union, which is the uh, uh, European Investment Bank. Uh, and this is one of the main lenders worldwide in climate fun uh, finance. By the end of this year, uh, the European Investment Bank will stop funding fossil uh, and gas, including gas, uh, which is one of the most controversial uh, elements of, uh, let's say, the debate on how fast and how um, pra uh, pragmatically we can push forward uh, the green uh, transformation. What is, uh, uh, Vice President uh, Chris Peters, your vision for the infrastructural change that we are going to have to address and to mobilize? How are you going to um, funding? Uh, what is your choices, your plans, your instruments and mechanisms? And what is the role for innovation in this game? Vice President, we cannot hear you. Okay, you can hear me now? Yes. Yes, I shall repeat shortly. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Madam uh, Marini, uh, for this uh, detailed introduction and these uh, very important questions. And I would also like, of course, to start by thanking the organizers of the Prague uh, European Summit uh, for inviting me to represent the EIB on this year's uh, summit. Thank you for that. Uh, we are now at the crossroad, I must say, of the health crisis and of a climate emergency. And transport uh, is uh, at the heart of both issues. On the one hand, um, we are still emerging from the COVID-19 pandemic with uh, stranded uh, resources and growing inequalities. On the other hand, Transport is one of the largest emitting sectors and its uh, operational energy use is significant, accounting for more than 30 of the total, 30% uh, of the total energy consumption for all sectors of which more than 90% is oil based. However, transport and mobility is undergoing a period of unprecedented change. Over the next two decades, transport technology will change faster than at any time since the invention of the internal combustion engine. 
and political, economic, social, technological uh, trends are innovating transport services. And as mobility becomes increasingly connected and integrated, as uh, our awareness and requirements for as, uh, uh, accessible, uh, efficient, clean and safe transport become higher, the investment needs or the sector will necessarily adapt and change. We are currently under investing in our existing transport networks, so the investment needs and financing requirements for the sector will have to grow and adapt if we want to achieve a truly sustainable and integrated transport system. Ladies and gentlemen, with the uh, continuous growth and of the population and ongoing urbanization, there are a number uh, a number of mobility changes and challenges. Sustainability, safety, and societal impact are uh, almost uh, our daily concerns. We need to speed up the mobility tra uh, transition to keep up with the fast changing global dynamics, which requires innovative approaches and better solutions. We need, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, enable more than one technological pathway to create real green options for the whole sector as the investment decisions we make today will determine success or failure in the decades ahead. We, the European Investment Bank, acknowledges and supports the four global recognized objectives that define sustainable mobility as being accessibility, efficient, safe and green. And as the EU Climate Bank, the European Investment Bank Group has ambitious climate action and environmental targets. We always seek to be a catalyst for the necessary change in transport funding and financing both in Europe but also around the world. The EIB has been one of the world's largest multilateral providers of finance for years. And in 2019, a very important year for us, we made uh, a quantum, uh, quantum leap by stopping the financing of energy projects uh, reliant uh, on fossil uh, fuels. We also prom uh, promised to, one, align all activities with uh, Paris Agreement. Secondly, invest at least 50% of annual EIB financing in climate action and environmental sustainability by 2025. And last but not least, support for 1 trillion euro of climate and environmental investment in the decade ending in 2030. And so, Solidify, uh, our overarching goal of helping Europe uh, become carbon neutral by 2020. Last year, the EIB group developed a climate bank roadmap, a five-year plan to translate these promises into action. The EIB group climate bank roadmap is our new five-year plan to ensure that all investments are in line with the Paris Agreement. It accelerates the transition to green economies by supporting the European Green Deal, building resilience to climate change and protecting nature and encouraging innovation. The Climate uh, Bank Roadmap clearly prioritizes the, the financing of sustainable infrastructure, electrification of the transport sector and the use of other sustainable fuels. Our priorities this year include uh, the development of a new plan to support climate adaptation and resilience in the face of growing threats posed by businesses and communities. In parallel and in response to the new European Commission's Smarter, More the Sustainable Transport Strategy, the Bank has initiated the review of the overall transport lending policy, a process which will align the, the, its the transport activities, not only uh, with the Climate Bank uh, Roadmap, but also with European Commission strategies emerging as a response to the new European Green Deal, as well as in other areas of the EU transport policy. However, ladies and gentlemen, 
The EIB has been the EU climate bank for a long time and sustainability has been part of the bank DNA. In terms of transport, historically, the bank has supported to a large extent clean investments in the railway sector and urban public uh, transport, for example. Um, and to give you a, a figure, investments in lower carbon transport have already increased from 6.7 billion in 2019 to 7.2 billion in 2020, an increase of almost 10%. I hope it's clear that for us, um, we uh, are uh, believers that the transport and mobility is very important, that uh, also we have used uh, European instruments, and I give you some because I've noticed that the time is running, uh, that uh, Cleaner Transport Facility launched in December 2016, um, the EIB has been supporting the rollout of cleaner public transport fleets and uh, electronic changing uh, networks. Also, I can um, um, uh, say that the Connecting Europe facility uh, blending call is also very important and that um, in the past 10 years, the bank has invested more than 4 billion in R&D for greening the automotive sector and 1 billion to support battery pilot projects across the EU member states are very, very important uh, initiatives like the future of mobility. I shall close uh, my, uh, my, my speech. Um, I think that we need a holistic and multi-model approach is very well uh, needed. And we as bank, the European uh, Investment Bank and the Climate Bank, um, for Europe are convinced that we can invest a lot of money, but not uh, only banks and public authorities, we need also the private sector. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Vice President Peters. I would like just to chip in with a uh, reminding of a Larry Flink um, speech in Venice a few days ago, calling for an overhaul of the financial system and Bretton Woods institutions, because we need uh, private investors on board, as you said, although the uh, public sector is fundamental. And uh, fossil fuel subsidies maybe, and I would like any, um, your idea on that, uh, may be also a way to co-finance a just transition. I mean, this is one of the objectives of the Green Deal to uh, phase out fossil fuels. What, what do you think about that? Yes, I, I think it's, it's, it's very important. First, what you have said, the private sector. We need the private sector very uh, uh, urgent because the, the amounts of investments are, are, are so large that not only European Commission, not only uh, the European Investment Bank uh, can do so. Now, uh, I think uh, that also the taxonomy will uh, bring some clarity uh, in the debate also for the private investors and the private funds. And I hope that with the, the decision that we have taken, not uh, longer investing in uh, uh, fossil fuels, that this is not only a policy of the European Investment Bank, but shall also be a policy of all the investors and all the funds active uh, not only in uh, in Europe but also in the United States and uh, in the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Vice President Peter spoke about this holistic dimension of the way we have to redesign transport and multimodality being an extremely important part of it and even a shift in uh, behaviors and how we use transport means. Uh, we know that Riga is extremely forward-looking and is uh, uh, experimenting with different methods and different uh, instruments. Can you give us an overview and tell us what is your vision for the future of mobility in Riga? Um, I'm sorry, um, Nika, Kos, um, Ni <laughs> Nika Kotovica, from, uh, she's the urban uh, planner for the city of Riga. Sorry. Thank you very much for 
introducing me and for giving me a chance to speak here. Uh, so let's move now to the northern European city of Riga, where actually over the last weeks uh, we are experiencing the hottest summer ever with lots of uh, temperature records beaten. So that is another sign of the climate change, most probably. And uh, uh, I would like to share our experience, our inspiring story of the city of Riga, how we are tackling the transport issues. So first of all, Riga has always been a bit more active than all the other cities in the Europe. So Riga was the first EU capital to sign the Covenant of Mayors already in 2008. And since that, a lot of things developed in our city in a positive way. And currently, we are taking decisive steps towards climate neutrality. In example, in the beginning of this year, Riga also joined the Paris Climate Initiative, cities leading the way to climate neutrality uh, by signing that declaration. And we have confirmed our readiness to address climate issues during this specific difficult time of pandemics, pointing out that this is one of the ways to facilitate better urban environment higher quality of life for our city residents. Uh, but evidently, today we will focus on transportation and as elsewhere in the Europe, also in my city, transport is the main polluter of the urban environment of Riga with CO2 emissions and other greenhouse gases. And this is actually really surprising because I mentioned in the beginning that I'm coming from northern European city where 60% of energy resources goes for production of heat energy. And even on that baseline, the transportation over the last years has become the leading polluter with CO2 emissions. But I just mentioned in the beginning that we are signing uh, those uh, uh, so that we have joined the Covenant of Mayors and we are doing a lot of action. Uh, so uh, basically, what is the baseline situation in my city? We have a comparative advantage of polycentric urban environment and uh, of uh, uh, well-developed public transportation, which is resource efficient and reasonable, reasonable way of transportation in the city due to uh, the baseline situation. And we have worked a lot to make our public transport modern and emission free. So nowadays already about 60% of public transport fleet is zero emission. It's uh, electric power driven, it's hydrogen or it's hybrid low emission vehicles. And remembering that also the production of electricity in Riga is comparatively green. Actually, we are the third in the Europe of uh, renewables in our energy balance. Uh, that gives us an advantage to develop this public transportation even more. So nowadays in our city, 50% of all journeys are sustainable, meaning that they are made by public transportation, by walking or by cycling. And another 50% of journeys are made by conventional fuel fed cars. Okay, that's briefly about the baseline. Uh, speaking about our vision and our way to solve those transportation issues, um, the city's long-term strategy prioritizes public transportation, cycling and walking. So I think that's by definition now in many other cities as well. But we have drafted our vision for the future mobility in our city, where urban mobility is ensured by integrated, sustainable and digitally open transportation system. And what do I mean by that? So first of all, uh, in Riga, we have implemented a concept 
of Urban Mobility Lab. An Urban Mobility Lab is a collaboration platform to co-design, test and deploy innovations in urban mobility in my city. Uh, in this lab, we are working together, experts, university students, tutors, our active citizens, seniors, and other groups uh, or other stakeholders. And we have designed, in example, the uh, <coughs> uh, pattern for rig streets that they better can accommodate multi-modality. And currently in this lab, we are prototyping a blockchain-driven mobility as a service solution, an integrated platform for planning and paying for journeys of public transportation, which facilitates sustainable multimodal and uh, multimodal mobility and uh, increases public trans tra transport ridership. Uh, we do believe that this technology can help us uh, <clears throat> to automate collaboration among multiple mobility stakeholders who are currently not collaborating and not sharing data each with other. So uh, the ultimate goal of that system is to provide multi-mobility for everyone in our city so that people can smoothly travel around the city, changing from public transportation to shared mobility to micro-mobility like uh, e-bikes and uh, e-scooters and other more sustainable mobility modes than uh, trend than uh, conventional uh, fuel uh, cars. And uh, in conclusion, I want to emphasize that the city of Riga is implementing many soft and hard measures, and we are prior prioritizing soft measures over hard measures. So nowadays, mobility management is uh, thing what we use to develop or to provide better transport opportunities in our city. <clears throat> so that's briefly uh, the way how Riga is developing its mobility and I will be pleased to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you are depicting a future in which uh, cities are not going to be designed around cars, basically. Um, and this is a system change because uh, for the last 100 years, what we had was urban spaces that had the car in the center and they were kings. And cars are also shifting um, behavior themselves, because they're becoming intelligent and smart, and they're communicating and exchanging data. And they're also becoming, as Innovat, Marian Bocek, is going to tell us, a source of energy that can be sent back to the electricity grid and an opportunity for storage solutions in urban areas. Thank you, uh, Arvea, for the, for the kind introduction. Uh, uh, Nika, it's amazing to see what uh, what Riga is doing uh, in terms of uh, sustainable green mobility. Uh, also, uh, lots of kudos uh, to uh, to Chris on um, on the EIB's uh, commitment to uh, uh, you know to supporting the the battery value chain. I'm the uh, co-founder and CEO of Innobat, which aims to become really Europe's uh, first fully vertically integrated uh, battery utility that looks at. Uh, Really, at providing the circular economy approach uh, to uh, to cities, you know, to uh, to countries, um, all the way from mining R and D to recycling and charging, uh, we do it by partnering with uh, strategic uh, players and, and really marrying, you know, the uh, the actors that typically don't uh, don't work or talk. To
even uh, the people in the labs, you know, the technological players, uh, the, some of the technological breakthrough companies, both in the US, but also in, in Europe uh, with the industrial giants uh, like Chess, uh, Siemens, Rio Tinto, which, uh, which are our uh, stakeholders. So as you, as you pointed out, you know, battery is really the, uh, uh, the heart of a new revolution that we're seeing. You know, in the 19th century, it was, uh, it was all about uh, switching you know, from manual to mechanical labor, industrial revolution, 20th century has been all about revolution and, and 21st century it's 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 uh, it's an electrification uh, revolution uh, a massive uh, shift we're seeing in the infrastructure uh, sector you know from mobility to uh, to energy and, um, and you know but what we try to provide is is really a one-stop solution to uh, to electromobility what we call cradle to cradle where we're looking for really different elements of the uh, of the EV uh, battery value chain, uh, where as you as you correctly pointed out, Arvea, uh, you know the the batteries are driving you know the transformation of the industry, which is supported by great fundamentals. Uh, you know it's it's really the behavioral patterns we're seeing. Uh, a lot of the millennials uh, really caring about uh, environment, uh, which uh, which pleases me. You know to see that. Uh, uh, more and more of the um, of the next generation is uh, is switching uh, uh, to electromobility. Uh, at the same time, we have uh, some great technological innovation around uh, battery cell chemistry, around charging infrastructure, which is propelling uh, demand for industries. And uh, and this is all supported and augmented uh, by the regulatory support uh, uh, that uh, that is being driven by different countries. You know, the the top uh, economies. You look at the G20 countries. Uh, uh, mostly all of them have at least 25 to 30 uh, percent target uh, for uh, for reaching EV penetration by the end of decade. Uh, at the same time, you know, you have uh, some true leaders in this uh, in this race for uh, for clean energy and clean mobility. Uh, the Nordics uh, basically expecting to completely phase out uh, their internal uh, combustion engines by by the end of decade. So uh, we're seeing a massive shift in, in, in behavioral uh, patterns, uh, and this is putting an incredible demand pressure on, on the batteries It expected that at the end of the decade there will be a need for more than 100 gigafactories globally uh, more than 3700 gigawatt hour of uh, capacity uh, for lithium-ion batteries just to support you know the uh, the electromobility trends this raising question uh, how are we gonna power uh, our charging you know how are we gonna make sure that the gigafactories uh, which uh, you know typically you need a 50 megawatt of uh, of power for each 10 gigawatt hours of capacity are green are sustainable so it raises a question of you know the entire value chain and, and this is something we're trying to address uh, through uh, our really circular economy approach where uh, we are currently developing uh, our pilot line in slovakia uh, why Slovakia? Well, you know, we uh, we happen to uh, uh, be from uh, from this part of the world, uh, uh, but also as the biggest car manufacturer uh, per capita in the world. You know, we have we have five million people produce more than one million cars. We felt that it's only pertinent uh, the Slovaks or Czechs uh, come up with a, a solution to uh, to electromobility and to what many people in Europe consider to be a technological sovereignty crisis, uh, where we have a huge dependency on lithium-ion batteries from Korea and, uh, and China. Uh, the fact that we're facing an oligopoly, uh, close to three-fourths of, of the battery supply come outside of uh, Europe. So I'm glad to see you know, that European Commission is, uh, is taking initiative with the EU battery directive and the rules of origin uh, to really uh, address this crisis and, and, and support uh, uh, battery manufacturing and the entire battery value chain, which, uh, which is obviously forcing uh, cell manufacturers like Innobet to think of you know what are you going to do at the back end of the life of the batteries? Uh, uh, you know, and 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 we are introducing uh, you know recycling solution through a, through our Hydromet uh, technological partner. Uh, but very importantly, what we're doing in terms of uh, our manufacturing roadmap is to make sure that uh, our gigafactories of the future are powered by green electrons. Um, and we're doing that uh, currently in our pilot line, which uh, which is under construction in Vodorati, uh, which is outside of Bratislava. Uh, we're deploying uh, solar energy, 
um, and uh, and actually deploying an energy storage uh, pilot solution using Ironflow technology that uh, that provides uh, long duration storage uh, for up to uh, ten hours, which is very important to address the intermittencies uh, uh, that you need um, 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 they need to address uh, because of uh, solar or wind energy. Uh, in terms of you know the Gigafactory scale up, uh, you know we're we're talking to a number of renewable energy uh, partners uh, to uh, to make sure that. Our gigafactories will have uh, a captive sort of source of green power uh, to make sure that everything that comes out of our factories uh, is green, is European, and uh, and, and comes out of uh, recyclable um, active uh, materials. How to actually turn car into a source of energy? It's it's a it's a it's a very good question. Um, you know, when you look at the legislation that surrounds. Uh, um, really, the, the requirements for uh, for bus battery pack manufacturers. Uh, the moment battery pack uh, and the battery cells are at less than 80% state of charge, uh, you know you need to recycle. You need to basically replace uh, uh, the pack with new cells or, or replace the pack altogether. Uh, which means that de facto you still have a very functional uh, battery that you can use for energy storage systems uh, that you can use uh, really for you know for uh, for, for charging uh, infrastructure as well and uh, and uh, we're working with a number of partners on, uh, on the second life uh, usage of, uh, of batteries uh, uh, especially for the energy storage applications which are a key component and key uh, solution to uh, addressing uh, how to make sure that the switch to electromobility uh, doesn't actually increase the, uh, the CO2 uh, footprint, but make sure that uh, you know the, the production uh, and the massive production rollout that we see, with more than now a thousand gigawatt hours of capacity being announced, um, you know, in Europe over the next decade. You know, we need to make sure that it that it's that is green, and the energy storage uh, is, a, is a is a is a is a big component of that. So, uh, um, you know, it's it, it's it's really. All about integrating the, the different pieces uh, of the puzzle r d uh, that allows you to actually address and uh, and create the next generation chemistry materials that allow you to actually lower the cobalt footprint and then tie it with you know energy storage that makes sure that you know you have green electrons for your production and then making sure that you have a recycling solution that allows you to take out active materials you know the nickel the cobalt um and um and lithium and, and and keep it back into the production ecosystem making sure that the active materials don't have to uh, leave europe and uh, and are basically processed and and are entering the uh, the production value chain in europe this is a very comprehensive picture and it's giving us an insight into how complex is the shift to this new energy world and the technologies and the industry of tomorrow. Because in a vertical system uh, like the one which is traditionally uh, the fossil fuel systems, you have a simple management structure, which is not the case with renewables and which is not the case with the innovative technologies that we are bringing forward. Circularity is a very important issue and LCA is a very important issue to make sure that across the supply chain all resources are kept in the circle as long as possible. And I have a question about, you're talking about, and uh, Commissioner Maro Shevkovic was talking about um, the importance of uh, critical materials and the strategic importance of critical materials in uh, terms of global competition. You were talking about the dependency on uh, global exporters such, such as China, which is also a, a, a rival in uh, some respect. Um, we're going to face this competition and we're trying to find tools such as the cardboard border adjustment mechanism, uh, integrating KPIs in supply chains for measuring circularity in content of products. This is uh, mostly a, a question for both of you. Uh, you, Maros, from a technical point of view and uh, you from, let's say, the regulatory uh, point of view. How do you uh, see this transition? Are we going to be able to defend our own industry and how can we work together with these partners to increase independency and localization of supply chains for a better future? Chris, you want to go first? Uh, maybe. <laughs> it's very kind of you. Uh, thank you for, for the, this question. Like you have said, it, it is uh, 
uh, holistic and uh, multi-level approach that, that we need. Um, perhaps one uh, of the elements that I believe very strongly uh, when you sp speak about uh, European uh, sovereignty or autonomy, that is the circular economy. I think that we have a lot to offer uh, to make sure that uh, we can recycle uh, a lot of uh, raw materials uh, in, in already some uh, some tools and so on, this, this circular economy can and must play a very, very important role. That's my first point. The second point is that, of course, um, we, we must be, uh, be sure that uh, with uh, our allies uh, in the rest of the world, we have their uh, very transparent and also very acceptable when you look to environmental issues and social issues, that we uh, make sure that uh, these raw materials uh, uh, are entre GMA, uh, very clean. But for me, uh, circular economy uh, will be and shall be a, a very important answer uh, to your question. And we as bank, of course, support uh, this circular economy with a lot of initiatives coming from uh, not only uh, the, 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 the member states, but uh, also from cities, because Circular economy uh, is also very, very important when you look to the big cities uh, uh, in Europe. Thank you. I, I, I would agree. Uh, obviously, this this one-stop uh, solution and creating the uh, the battery value chain ecosystem in Europe is uh, is important. Uh, how we're doing it? You know, we're we're, we're trying to be. The bridge, you know, between the uh, the technological players and the industrial players, so uh, so we can actually, uh, you know, introduce the uh, the pilots um, for energy storage and recycling solutions uh, to Europe, whether it's around hydro metallurgy uh, solution on the recycling side or or flow battery systems uh, on the on the energy storage and the uh, and the green uh, production side. And and I'm uh, very happy and, and grateful to the European Commission that uh, Innobat uh, as uh, as the only central European company uh, has has received uh, actually an IPSE um, um, in resources and IPSE award uh, to actually develop uh, this type of energy uh, storage energy center solutions uh, and also uh, to uh, to continue our R and D uh, development you know technological roadmap uh, on identifying advanced electrolytes all the way to uh, to solid state. So I think uh, this three state uh, factor. You know, between uh, between really the uh, the regulatory bodies, uh, you know, the governing bodies like European Commission, uh, combined uh, with the uh, really uh, on the ground um, uh, interaction between uh, top tech um, uh, solutions and and the big industrial infrastructure players, the Chessies, you know, the Siemens uh, of the world. This is really the uh, the solution where you can fast track uh, the rollout of. Uh, of European uh, type of technologies uh, to make sure that, you know, everything from mining of the active materials all the way to R&D, recycling and charging uh, has European uh, uh, features and, uh, and remains in the continent. Thank you very much. Now, coming to Riga and the importance of cities, and we've heard from uh, Chris Peters, from Innovat, that cities are really playing an important role in fast-tracking as well the public procurement. Public procurement accounts for 14% of the European GDP. Therefore, if you want to create a new market, you have to change the way you do procurement. The Commission is working on that as well. DigiGrow is uh, a stress release guidelines on public procurement and we know that Riga is part of this effort and for instance on I think electric heavy trucks um, and also for construction together with other Nordics such as Oslo and obviously also the cities from this beautiful region. Can you tell us something about that? Uh, yes sure. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, sure. Um, our way is uh, uh, green public procurement, and that has been developed in the city of Riga over the last years. So basically, uh, we are applying a green public procurement principles in many public procurements in all 
different sectors. So starting from uh, schools, the furniture at the schools and uh, catering at schools and uh, ending uh, with technologies. Uh, however, as you mentioned, uh, there is not yet a full uh, EU regulation on this. So this is all being developed uh, step by step. And uh, in example, the city of Riga is currently implementing a project on uh, introduction of a circular construction uh, principles in uh, construction sector. Uh, so we definitely start with the municipality, but we want to make a system for the whole construction process in the city so that it all becomes circular and sustainable. And here is another very important aspect, but I want to add. So this also concerns to my previous uh, story about the transportation that it's extremely important to work with behavioral change because the city will never be sustainable if each city resident is not sustainable in his daily choices. So this is another aspect that our city is working hard through education of our uh, population, through many other incentives so that uh, our people are becoming more and more sustainable in their daily choices. So this concerns procurement or that concerns the goods that you are buying, that concerns your mobility behavior in the city and many other aspects. Thank you. This is very important. I'm reading um, about a poll and apparently people are skeptical and the main concern is uh, the complicated waste management of the batteries as and factor which makes uh, the transition towards electrical mobility not so sustainable. And I think we should tackle this, and um, I'm, I'm, this is a bit of a provocation for you all. Uh, we are coming from uh, 100 billion tons a year of resources used for our economies. The planet is limited, the resources available are limited, and that's why circular economy needs to be at the center of our new roadmap for development. But is it going to be like we're going to have to replace every single internal combustion engine car with an electric vehicles, or are we going to shift also in the way we operate and choose to, to move? Now it's uh, to you, Marianne, to start. We cannot hear you. Okay, thank, thank, we're playing a bit of ping pong here, Chris. I appreciate it. Uh, so um, I, I think this shift uh, obviously is, is, uh, is not happening overnight, uh, uh, but it's, it's, it's really it's one of the fastest growing uh, Industry sectors, electro mobility growing at you know 12% uh, on average a year uh, for the past decade, expected to grow even faster. Um, what uh, what I what I really expect to see is uh, is that at the end of the day um, you will have still combination of uh, you know kind of the, the legacy uh, mobility methods. Uh, you know where you're going to see in terms of, for example, commercial vehicle fleet uh, combination of the classical conventional engines. But more and more, um, you know, a greater percentage of uh, buses uh, being electrified, trains, you know, being uh, uh, being powered by by fuel cells uh, of the future. Uh, but obviously, this the technological development uh, is uh, not commensurate uh, and not as fast as we would like to see. You know, to to really uh, see a full adoption of uh, of electromobility. So I think, especially in the in the commercial vehicle and, and the aviation market, these are the specialists. Uh, OEM segments, uh, they account for 60% of the overall demand. Uh, this is the market uh, that is underserved, uh, that uh, that actually need a bit of customized uh, solution for battery cells, battery packs. This is actually the area where Innobat is focused on, uh, rather than really the uh, the, the large uh, OEMs to, to provide bespoke uh, uh, batteries. Uh, um, and I think, you know, with the technological advancement, uh, we will see faster and faster adoption of uh, of you know electric vehicles, uh, we're seeing it uh, much much faster in the passenger vehicle market, in the commercial vehicle market, uh, 
you know, it expected that uh, in Europe by 2040, we'll have 750,000 electric buses uh, arise from, I believe the current number is uh, 20,000. So, so the growth will be exponential, but, uh, but it, you know, I think the shift uh, we'll see over the next uh, two decades to, to truly uh, manifest and, uh, and, and to see uh, really uh, a clean and, um, and, um, and, and, you know, green uh, type of uh, mobility. I assume that also we'll see some amazing innovation in terms of urban air mobility. There are a number of uh, newcomers coming into the field, uh, developing air taxis, uh, which will be fully electrified uh, starting in the second half of this decade. And uh, so I think uh, you will see that, uh, you know, the uh, the modes of transportation will, will evolve. Uh, I think we're going to see a, a much more innovation, um, uh, much more uh, new patterns uh, in the way people drive. Uh, but I think that the shift will be gradual over the next uh, 20 years. Thank you. It's of course a very important question uh, because despite a lot of progress, transport is uh, still going in the wrong uh, direction. Uh, you know that uh, emissions uh, from transport uh, increased 20% uh, from 2019 to uh, to the, the end of 2018, and um, unfortunately, um, the, the the need for, uh, for road transport is still growing. This uh, we must be realistic at the one side. Uh, that's very clear. We have a big problem in transport and mobility. Uh, and the other side, the the goals are very clear. In uh, 2030, uh, minus 55% uh, emissions. That means that we have uh, a very short period uh, to make the difference and to reach this 55% five, uh, uh, goal that we approved uh, in the European Commission, European Parliament and so on. Um, when you look to the reality for uh, attending that goal, you need more or less 30 million uh, electric uh, vehicles in, you, in the European Union. Um, and what shall you do with the existing uh, vehicles? Uh, sending to, to Africa is, is, of course, no, no option because then you replace the, the problem. Um, now, saying that, um, optimism is a moral duty, of course. Uh, great philosopher Karl Popper have said that. Um, and I believe that we must do uh, the almost, uh, utmost uh, to reach that, that goal, and that's the reason why we as European Investment Bank are massive um, investing in, 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 this, uh, in, this, uh, in this project, in the Green Deal and, and the Paris uh, Alignment and so on uh, agreement, but we must be sure that uh, private sector is on board, but also like uh, um, the the other participant in the debate has said uh, a culture change uh, for all of the uh, inhabitants in the european union is 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 needed to 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 uh, to have this this very ambitious goal uh, realized in 2030 but we are realistic we are there uh, and we think that with uh, a lot of uh, advisory a lot of initiatives that it's possible, but it shall be um, tough. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are coming to an end. Uh, I would like just to thank you all for your uh, participation. I think it is very important what you said. We need to tell the truth because people understand the problems and they want answers and they don't want uh, dreams without a realistic basis. We all know that we need to engage. We have to work and with the engineers, with the technologists, the innovators to find the solutions. Thank you very much.